Hi, everyone. Welcome to our weekly masterclass series. We're delighted to have you joining from all over the world. So I myself am based in Switzerland right now, and it's 6 p.m., but I'm sure you're joining from all different time zones. So what we're doing today is actually looking through schools, specifically INSEAD and LBS, and we're taking a look into how these schools their, how their culture is set up, as well as how the application process is. All of these schools in general from all our weekly sessions have received record-breaking applications in the last 12 months. So what we're looking to give you today is a bit of insights so that they can really help you um, with your journey with these schools. So I actually am fortunate enough to work with Fortuna, where we have a whole host of experts um, that have either worked at the schools, like you'll meet soon, Emma and Caroline, or that have attended the schools directly and still have a close bond. So within the next hour, we will specifically go through the schools that I've mentioned. But if you have any questions that we don't address, like please feel free to reach out to us for a 30 minute consultation. We do a lot of deep diving into your CVs um, before we actually take the calls so that we can make sure to use that 30 minutes to the maximum potential. So let me start with introducing the team today. So you'll have Caroline on the line and she is the former director of MBA admissions and financial aid at INSEAD. And we also have Emma here that used to work at London Business School as a director and admissions consultant. Let me finalize by introducing quickly myself. So I used to attend INSEAD and have since kept very close contact with the school and myself help applicants with their journeys throughout the application process. So Caroline, Emma, is there anything you wanna to add to introduce yourself before we jump in? I was just really- Go ahead, Emma. Yeah. Sorry, Caroline, if you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, well, just to add that I also did the program myself. So I'm an um, alum of INSEAD. I did the program in 2003 and then went back to the school um, as admissions director a couple of years later. And I'm very passionate about INSEAD and other international MBA programs. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, over to you, Emma. Yes, hi everyone. Um, thrilled to be here today. And um, yes, I have uh, been working with Fortuna now for, gosh, I think it's about, I was trying to work out today, about eight or nine years um, as a director and consultant expert coach. Um, but I, my background is uh, admissions at London Business School and um, years at the Boston Consulting Group doing recruitment um, into their um, into their offices across Europe. So, yep, very pleased to be here today. And I'm not sure if my picture is showing up, Caroline, can you see I me? I can or... see you, yeah. I can see you as well. <laughs> I can't see myself, but that's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. Perfect, both. Thank you so much for the introduction. So everyone, what we'll be doing today is we'll go through top questions that you have. And please obviously like keep sending questions through. We'll try and have a bit of a Q&A at the end of the session. And we'll get both Emma and Caroline to address these. But before we jump into that, I just wanted to remind you of the next sessions that are coming up. So we have NYU, Stern, Duke, and Johnson Cornell on June the 22nd, which is the next one. And then we have Berkeley, UCLA, and Yale coming up on the 29th. You'll always be able to see the recordings of these sessions, just in case you can't attend, you know, the 12 noon Eastern time. So starting with the discussion topics. So what is special about LBS? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, so I, I think it, it's such a broad topic. I was thinking about this advance of the session and I mean, I could talk pretty much all day about what I think is special about LBS, but the same way Caroline is very passionate about INSEAD, I'm very passionate about, about LBS. Um, I think the first thing, to probably mention is the location. So if any of you have been fortunate enough to um, visit the campus at Regent's Park in London pre-pandemic, uh, it's a glorious campus. It is um, right on the edge of Regent's Park. 
uh, very historic, the Nash Terraces, but it has now some extraordinary new buildings which were opened about three or four years ago, um, which have really expanded the campus and given the school room to, to grow. Um, the benefit, obviously, of, of being in London is the exposure that the school has to the city, um, to recruiters, to speakers. And, you know, in the sort of seven years or so I spent on campus, there were an enormous number of, of very, very interesting speakers sort of um, visiting campus on a regular basis. So certainly the location is key. Um, London being in, in sort of a central time zone. So for me here, it's 5 p.m., but I can also do business in the US and, and in Latin America, but also in Asia earlier in the day. So when you are a student at the school, you do have that ability to sort of network across time zones very easily because you, are, you can reach both um, east and west on the same day. So I think, I think the access that um, the central London location provides to recruiters, um, the access to internships, um, you know, and just the visibility of the school being in a, in a very large um, global capital like London, that's certainly, I guess, the first thing that jumps out. Um, the second thing really is something that is probably also aligned very much with NCAD, and that's the global nature of the program, the global nature of the community. And, and I know Caroline could also, you know, talk about this for ages with NCAD. So, LBS has um, a very, very um, diverse class, a very diverse community. So the admissions teams across the, the, the suite of programs that they have there are very much about um, recruiting students into the class from all different nationalities, all different cultures. So there is no, I guess, one dominant culture um, in the MBA class, for example. There are around about 60 to 70 nationalities each year that come in. Um, David and the team there really do actively seek to keep that culture broad and to, to make sure that there is no, um, as I say, no, no dominant culture in the school. So that's, that's something that by virtue of the class that comes in expands out to the rest of the, the experience. Um, the program itself, the curriculum is extremely global. There are things like the, the global business experience trips, which now head out to places like Lima, to Tel Aviv, to, um, to China, to, to where, you know, there, there are different options every year. So that's really something that is um, quite specific to, to LBS, to NCAD, and to, you know, to some of the European programs and, and something very much that the, the school sells itself on. Um, and I think the third thing that I wanted to touch on um, is probably this idea of cross-generational learning. So anybody who's actually had a look at the school and the suite of programs, many of you listening today might be looking at the MBA program, but the school also, um, as part of being quite dynamic and quite forward thinking, has expanded its portfolio of programs um, greatly over the past sort of 10, 15 years. So there are a number of early career programs, the Masters in Management, um, the Masters in Financial Analysis, um, Masters in Analytics and Management, the Finance Programs, and then right through to the sort of Senior Experience Programs like Sloan. So what that actually means for the experience of people on campus is that when you have an elective, you are learning alongside both people who are perhaps quite recently graduated from university, but also people who have right up to C-suite level experience. And I think that adds a really sort of specific um, flavor to the LBS classroom. And that's certainly something that, that students um, sort of look for and, and talk about when they're commenting on their, their LBS um, time. And Emma, like people come from all backgrounds, right? We have Eugene here that comes from a military and civil service background. And I, I think it would be great to, you know, for you to speak to that experience, right? LBS is not only consultants and, you know, with financial background candidates. That's absolutely right. And, you know, traditionally, when I started at the school, which is a very long time ago now, um, it was recognised very much as a, as a finance school. That was what it was famous for. It had the Masters in Finance programme, which it still has. It was based in London, financial capital. Um, and it was very much seen by, by people, you know, as a, as a place to go to study finance. And over the years, it has very much kind of blossomed into a, into a class that is 
representative of, of pretty much every single sector that you can think of. Um, interesting that we have someone from the military who's, who's listening um, and watching. So LBS has a military scholarship, for example. They are very keen on people who come from military backgrounds and some of the best candidates um, I saw come through the program when I was there came from that military background. Um, you know, the leadership opportunities that people have um, who come through with that kind of experience really adds value to the program. Um, they see people come from law backgrounds every year, and I've had a couple of clients from, from legal backgrounds. People come from health, um, obviously consulting, finance, um, sort of, and more and more over the past few years, sort of tech backgrounds, so people who from product management, that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, there's entrepreneurs, so people who have family business backgrounds. So, yeah, there's really, you know, in the same way that there's no dominant culture, there's no dominant industry. And that's one of the things that makes the experience there just such a dynamic kind of interesting, interesting place to be. Great. Thanks, Emma. So, Moving on to, you know, our next question, how would you describe the culture at INSEAD and who is a good fit? So Caroline, I'll pass this over to you. Thank you, B. Yeah, so a lot of commonalities, as Emma said, um, there are a lot of um, uh, commonalities between INSEAD and London Business School. So both incredibly diverse international communities. And, um, and, you know, partly as a result of that diversity, very, very dynamic communities. So so I think that um, you know the, the classroom is is very very stimulating, um, and uh, you know the experience on campus, the the uh, the, the, the social community, um, and and then of course the alumni network. It, it's incredibly active and, and dynamic, and and um, that is thanks to uh, you know the, the the school's ability to attract people from um, across the world who are doing um, you know a lot of different pursuing a lot of different careers and um, and what they have in common is that they are ambitious they're looking to um, you know build really strong careers in whatever um, d domain they're pursuing and they have a true interest in being a part of a very international community so I think that's something that people have in common um, both at INSEAD and London Business School. Um, something that is is a bit more specific to INSEAD I would say is is the incredible intensity of the program so it is a one-year program um, the pace is very fast um, some people describe it as you know drinking from a fire hose so um, that's something that you need to be prepared for and um, and that's something that the school is looking for in their applicants so are you someone who's prepared who embraces that kind of intense experience um, and, and will actively thrive in that because it is not for everybody, right? Some people are better suited to, um, to a longer program um, where you've got a more measured pace. So, so um, definitely that's something to be aware of is the, the intensity of the experience. Um, I would say that something that, that um, a lot of NCAD students and alumni have in common as well is the desire to have a positive impact um, INSEAD students are, are very ambitious, very smart, but also, um, you know, they want to use their skills and, and their talents and their education to have a positive impact in the world. Um, and if you can convey that in your application, then that, that will certainly um, help to show your alignment with, with INSEAD's values. Um, and then, you know, a distinctive part of the INSEAD experience, of course, is the multi-campus structure. Um, so you can choose to start either in Fontainebleau or Singapore. You can exchange between the campuses. Um, there's also an opportunity to study on the campus in Abu Dhabi. Um, perhaps in the future, we'll be able to come to um, the San Francisco hub. I'm here in the Bay Area and I'm delighted that the school has opened a center here, which they'll be using increasingly. Um, and I, I believe that, uh, you know, they'll be running some electives where you can come over um, to this part of the world and, and discover Silicon Valley. Um, so. So it's that multi-campus structure has also very much enhanced the, um, the exposure that you get at the school um, and that, that incredible international diversity and, and that learning experience. So, um, and most of the students do take advantage of that. When I did the program, um, I had been working in Paris before I went to INSEAD. So I chose to start in Singapore and spent most of the year there and then also went to Fontainebleau. Um, and having that sort of multi-campus experience was, was, was wonderful. Uh, um, and there's really, 
the, the, the programs run in parallel. So you get the same education, the same access to an incredible faculty, the same diversity of the student community, but you're just in a very different environment, right? So it, when you're in Singapore, um, you're in the heart of Southeast Asia, an incredibly fast growing um, uh, region. Um, Singapore is, is a wonderful hub for traveling around Southeast Asia in, in normal times, of course, somewhat challenging during COVID, but um, otherwise it's, you know, an, a wonderful hub for, for learning about, um, about Southeast Asia and, and also other parts of Asia. Whereas in Fontainebleau, um, it's a, a beautiful town in the middle of a forest um it's it's uh you know paris is very accessible but um the program is so intense that most students don't actually get get into paris very often but there's there's an incredible um social life on on campus and there's a large student community so there's always a lot happening so very very different environment um b you did the the program obviously so anything that you would add from your experience about the culture at the school no, and you're absolutely right. So if I take my coach hat off and put my personal one on, um, I actually evaluated both schools and uh, then decided to accept INSEAD. And that was exactly because I wanted that, you know, full immersive, you know, different campus experience with kind of these older candidates compared to US schools. So I completely agree that that's the choice. And, you know, putting back my coach hat on, this is a question that you know nearly every single client that we go through has that does want to apply to European schools it's always that INSEAD versus LBS and so at least from my standpoint that's a lot where I spend time on you know what is the perfect fit for you also because in at least my situation it's been quite clear cut on who would fit one school better than the other but one question I wanted to ask you both before we pass to the next topic. So we had an anonymous attendee that asked, you know, what if you don't have international experience? How would both of these schools react? So maybe just a quick answer from you both here on, you know, are LBS or NCAD open to candidates that don't have that international background? So I'll, I'll, go ahead, Emma. I was just going to say, I'll jump in on that one. So, so it is true that both schools do look for international experience as part of their sort of applicant profile. So there is no doubt that if you have a, a widely international profile, it is an advantage. That said, I have yet to come across any client or any candidate that has no international experience. And it's all about how you that word international um, so no you might not have you know been able to to study abroad before or travel widely or your job might not have enabled you to to move around a lot and particularly you know seeing that with people who have had plans to to, to be traveling internationally the past couple of years and that's been stymied you know jobs I've got clients who were supposed to be on transfer or secondment and they haven't been able to do that but that said the schools recognize that um international experience comes in other forms. So you might be working in a, in a multicultural team, you might be working or doing deals across borders, um, you might be managing people remotely, so in different geographical locations, um, you might be working with global clients, um, or you might have, you know, in your, in your personal life, had the, the advantage of being able to travel and experience different cultures that way. So there are different facets of international exposure. And I think that most people, if they dig deep, can find one or more of those within their own profile. Yeah, and um, I, I agree with Emma. I mean, not every, everyone has the same opportunities to get a lot of international exposure pre-MBA. Um, so emphasizing the, the exposure that you have had, even if it's from your own country, is helpful. And then also explaining your motivation. Why is it relevant for you to be part of a very international community? Um, you know, how is that important to you? Um, and, and emphasizing your motivation for, for, for learning from that type of community. So, so you can also make it, you know, more forward thinking. Thanks team. So now going to the next topic. So let's talk about professional experience. What is the right background? And I know we touched upon this a bit earlier seeing about the variety, but let's deep dive on this topic now on both schools. Okay, so, so in terms of, you know, the right background, you can start with saying there is no right background as such. 
um, and you know LBS and, and also INSEAD, they actively seek to bring in classes which have a representative population across you know as broad um, an industry and sector profile as they possibly can. So um, I guess if you are if you wanting to pigeonhole things, you can you can look at the different sort of funnels of candidates that come in as perhaps um, career advancers. So people who are looking to move their career on, you know, in the same sector or even the same function, but just to, to progress um, career changes. So people who come in and, and want to make a, a distinct shift and then entrepreneurs. So people who have that business idea, whether or not they want to put it into practice directly after the program or perhaps gain some wider experience and then perhaps look at setting up their own business a few years out. Um, but certainly, you know, I sort of touched briefly on some of the, the industries where, where people come into the program. Um, and you do still get people who come on what I would call a traditional track. So when I worked at BCG, you know, we had people coming in at sort of associate level who would then go off and, and do an MBA at one of the top schools and then come back and they would have moved up to consultant level. So there are um, often sponsored candidates who come through a track like that with either a consulting firm or an investment bank. Um, but then the main thing is that that wherever you come from or whatever industry you come from, on your resume, there is progression evidence. So um, you might be able to show that through sort of a traditional promotional track. You might be someone who can show a lot of depth. So you may have worked with one company for a long time, but you've perhaps moved around within different functions within that, that organization. Um, or you might be somebody who, ha who has a, a breadth of experience. So you might have you know, moved across several different industries um, and tried to, to experience new things. But I think um, the one thing that all admissions committees will look for um, is, is progress. So you know, evidence of, of moving forwards in your career, um, leadership. So whether that's through line management, but a lot of younger MBA candidates haven't had that opportunity, but you know, again, there are other ways to, to demonstrate that, whether it's by taking responsibility for different areas within your organization or perhaps um, mentoring juniors or, or whatever it might be. But, but the thing that sort of stands out is that usually the resumes of successful um, MBA candidates will show that there has been thought and planning and, um, you know, there's a, there's a self-awareness about, about how their career has moved from the time they graduated through to their, their point of application and, and people have been thoughtful and, and considered about the career decisions that they have made. You're absolutely spot on, Emma. And just to bring in, you know, one anonymous, uh, um, you know, attendee asked us, you know, is it okay to have an educational background? And then George instead, one of our other attendees said, you know, do you need to reach a specific career level um, in order to be able to apply. And I think you've correctly just explained that, that it's it's showing the progression regardless of industry. So both to our anonymous attendee and to George, it's really showing what you've done thus far in order to be able to show a successful application. Absolutely. But Emma, Caroline, anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, I, was, I mean, I, I think, was, sorry, go sorry. ahead, Emma. No, no, just, just one very quick thing, just about experience level. So there's a wide range of experience, right? So people who are very early in their careers to people who have quite a lot more experience. So that idea of, of not having to reach a specific level, it's about what your goals are and, and how what you have done to the point of application will translate in combination with an MBA to those goals that you outline in your essays. And as long as you can prove that, it's not about a sort of set experience level. Sorry, Caroline. I was, I was just gonna say that the admissions committee is looking for diversity. So in some, in some ways, you know, the, the question that we have on the screen is, is a bit of a trick question because there is no such thing as the right background, right? They're looking for diversity and they're looking for people from a lot of different backgrounds. And sometimes we speak with candidates who feel that because they don't have the typical pre-MBA background, they're not a management consultant, they're not an investment banker, et cetera, they think they're at a disadvantage. And actually it's often quite the contrary. Right. If, if you have um, some unusual work experience that can really help you to stand out. So what the, the schools are looking for is, um, you know, what you have achieved and whatever domain it is, what impact have you had? Because the perspective that they take is that your your past performance is the best predictor of your future success. So um, whatever domain you're in and whatever stage of your career you're at, 
They're looking for that evidence of, of impact, of results, and of rapid progression. So moving on to academics, which is always the big topic. So what are these schools looking for? Sure. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that, um, that these schools are looking for strong academics, but they're taking a holistic perspective. So they are not going to look at your, your GPA or your GMAT or your GRE um, in isolation. So what they're looking for is evidence that you have um, good academic capacity because the schools want to admit people who are going to succeed, right? They want people um, to come to the school and um, really thrive in the classroom, um, do well in their exams and, and um, you know, and, and really be able to benefit from that academic experience. They don't want to be admitting people who are going to struggle academically. Um, so to, to demonstrate that you have that capacity, um, they're going to be looking at a number of elements and you don't have to be outstanding on all of them, but you do have to be, um, you know, meet a certain threshold um, in some of those dimensions. So so the schools will be looking at um, your undergraduate degree. So they'll be looking at the institution where you studied. Um, the schools have an incredible knowledge of educational institutions around the world. Um, so they have an understanding of, you know, which are the top schools in different markets. Um, and, uh, you know, they will give a certain weighting to, um, to the top schools. Um, so they'll be looking at where you've studied, what you've studied. Um, you, they'll be looking at your GPA um, and they'll also be scrutinizing your transcript. So they'll be looking at, you know, how you did um, throughout the program, what grades you got. Um, and, and um, you know, especially if you took some quantitative courses, the, the, the quant's are always important for business school. And they'll be looking at how you did on those, um, th those parts of your undergrad. Um, and then if you have a master's program, you know, great. They'll also be looking at, at the same elements. Um, and then, of course, there's the GMAT or the GRE. So the schools are pretty agnostic on the test, but you do need to show that um, ideally, you know, you've, you've met a certain level. So um, the average scores at these schools are typically in the, in the low 700s. Um, the range is much broader than that. At INSEAD, they say they like to see a, um, a threshold for around sort of 70, 70th or 75th percentile or above on both the quant and the verbal. Um, you know, there is some flexibility there, but INSEAD can actually be less flexible than some other schools because, as I mentioned, you know, it's that one year format. It is very intense. The pace is fast. You know, you'll have exams every eight weeks. Um, there's no time really to um, sort of have a leisurely start or and there's not much time to catch up if you get behind. Um, so, you know, INSEAD can be less flexible sometimes on academic criteria than, than other top schools. So, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but if you do have, uh, you know, concerns, sometimes, you know, candidates are concerned that their, their undergraduate track red record wasn't great. Maybe they had some issue during those years, or maybe they just, um, you know, weren't mature enough to, to take their studies um, that seriously. And they were just busy with other, other, all the other extracurriculars on campus and so on. Um, you know, that does happen. And obviously you can't go back and change that. But what you can do is compensate for that with a strong performance in the GMAT or the GRE. And likewise, you know, if you're concerned that your GMAT or your GRE is a little bit borderline, um, then that's, uh, you know, if you have a strong undergrad, a really strong undergraduate track record, then that can help to compensate for that. Um, so they are taking that holistic perspective. But as I said, um, you know, it is important. You're applying to an academic program. At INSEAD, the admissions committee is composed um, half, uh, of half alumni, half um, faculty, and the faculty want to make sure that they're getting, you know, really smart students in their classroom. So, so they do care a lot about the academic profile of candidates. Emma, anything um, to add from the LBS perspective? Um, I guess the only thing I would say is that when you are completing your application, um, as you're saying, you know, there are, there are often places where you can explain if you've not performed, you know, as, as well as you would have wanted in your undergraduate um, degree. But also I think just um, a sort of caveat on the whole GMAT thing, as this, you know, as we see the scores kind of climb and climb and climb at, at all the different schools, is that you need to be aware that um, some institutions, um, banks and consulting firms, particularly when they recruit, are looking at 
looking for a specific cutoff for GMAT. So admissions committee will be looking to see that your career goals are kind of in, a, in alignment with your academics and GMAT score. So for example, if you want to go and work for an MBB firm, so McKinsey, um, Bain or BCG, you are going to need to demonstrate in your application some very, very strong academics and a strong, strong GMAT score because those um, companies just use the GMAT as a cutoff in terms of who they look to interview. So I think it's it's quite important to remember that when you're applying that you really want to align those career goals with your sort of academic performance. Um, but yeah, other than that, LBS looking for very similar things um, as INSEAD. One more thing, I guess, GMAT, GRE, they're probably a little bit more accommodating of the GRE than INSEAD, Caroline. I think that's still probably the case, isn't it? I would, yes. I would yeah, so whereas INSEAD says, um, you know, ideally about so 70th percentile or above on the GMAT, they're looking for about 80th percentile or above on the GRE. Yeah. That's true. And so everyone, I know we don't often cover this even in our initial calls. Um, we always talk about the academics and the professional background, but one part that we often don't speak about that is instead crucial to the application is actually the extracurriculars. So we have a lot of candidates that come through and I've seen many firsthand with you know, great professional backgrounds, great educational backgrounds, yet all they have done is that. There is nothing else that you know, catches your eye from an extracurricular standpoint. So let's talk now a bit, like what are these schools really looking for from an extracurricular standpoint? Yeah, so this is a really interesting one, isn't it? Because, you know, we see so many clients come through who think that really what matters only is good academics and a strong professional background. And for sure, that is a really, really important part of the, the application process. But schools aren't just interested in those things, they are interested in, in your holistic profile, as Caroline was saying before. So, um, you know, what else is it that you bring to an MBA program? And one of the best ways that you can demonstrate that is through your extracurricular um, involvement. So often the things that you do outside work and outside your academics are the kind of things that will sort of show who you are as a person, what your motivations are and what drives you to succeed what are you passionate about you know what really kind of lights you up inside um, and extracurriculars and being able to demonstrate and, and highlight these either on your resume or also for example in the LBS application there's a, a 400 word mini essay which asks you about your involvement um, in these activities is a really really important part of, of the application process um, in terms of, of, of what you do and what you include, I think the really key thing is to make sure that these activities are meaningful. So in a similar way that Caroline was mentioning about, you know, the impact that you've had in your professional life, you need to have shown or demonstrated impact in your extracurriculars. So whether you are involved in sort of volunteering, um, whether you are playing sport to a high level or whatever it is, you need to have demonstrated that you have had some kind of concrete impact. Um, certainly, you know, at the bottom of a resume, you can often put down just your sort of general hobbies or interests, if you like, but being able to, to put some really sort of interesting, um, interesting extracurriculars that show where you might have um, led an event or um, captained a team or traveled abroad to work for Habitat for Humanity or, or whatever it is, um, will really add value and, and add weight to your to your sort of um, profile. So, for example, this year I've had a, a younger client, actually an early career um, applicant who was applying to a Masters in Management program. And she had been responsible for um, running the whole um, TEDx um, talks and, and conference at her undergraduate institution. And that was such a great thing for her to be able to put on her resume because it showed that she had run a, a major event. It showed that she had managed a large team. Um, she had worked with a quite a substantial budget for that. And she had managed year on year to, in, you know, even in a pandemic, to increase um, the, you know, the, the number of attendees um, at the event. So all of those things gave a really good insight into her ability to, to, to work with others, to lead, and all of those kind of softer things that, that MBA programs are looking for. Um, but I think the other thing is that 
sort of certainly at LBS, they want to know that you're going to engage in the community. It's not just about what you do in the classroom and how you perform in your exams, even though those, those things are really important. But it's are you a, a fun person with a good sense of humour? Are you going to, to get involved in different clubs? Are you going to be someone who really loves tattoo, which is the big cultural festival that they have on campus, pandemic situations allowing? You know, are you going to go and represent the school at, um, at MBAT, you know? So, so all of these things really do add up and it is something that schools take um, note of and, and put you know, great weight on in terms of just looking at how you're gonna fit into the school community. And I think that's also what makes candidates interesting. And at least this was my perspective, especially INSEAD, that has a lot of space um, on where you can put extracurriculars. I think even more than LBS has specific fields where they even ask you to speak about that. Um, I think this is really what makes the candidates stand out. But Caroline, um, and I know this question came also from an attendee, what was your perspective with INSEAD? I mean, is extracurricular really what makes a candidate pop uh, or not? Well, it can be, um, but there are lots of different things that can make a candidate pop. So it doesn't have to be extracurriculars, but, but it, it, it is important, right? I mean, as Emma said, they're looking to see if a candidate is, um, you know, a well-rounded individual who will contribute to the program and not just come to the school, um, you know, for the academic experience and then to land a great job afterwards. Because, you know, business school, probably more than any other graduate program, is about the community, right? And building those relationships and building that network. And, you know, partly that happens in the classroom, but actually probably much more than the classroom. You know, it happens outside of the classroom and all of the other things that are going on. So the schools are very keen to attract people who will embrace those opportunities. Um, and, you know, sometimes get questions from candidates who are concerned that, um, you know, the schools are looking very for a very specific type of extracurricular, right? You know, do I have to have um, excelled in sports or do I have to have, you know, um, done a lot of fundraising or, um, you know, work for charity? They think that, you know, maybe there's some specific extracurricular that is better than something else. And it's really not about anything in particular, right? It's absolutely what is important to you. Um, there's no particular extracurricular that carries more weight than anything else. It's more about, you know, the, um, how you've got engaged, what you've done, um, what impact you've had, what you've achieved. And is it something that, you've really care, that you really care about? And, um, you know, they also like to see a track record in your extracurriculars over time, that it's not something that you just, you know, took up six months before the application deadline. It looks a bit suspicious that it was for the purpose of your MBA application. So, you know, they like to see that, that track record over time. Um, and for some candidates, you know, especially early career candidates, that can be, as Emma said, you know, an area where um, it can help them to stand out um, in, in a situation where perhaps they don't have um, a huge amount of professional experience. Perhaps they have some amazing extracurriculars that can help them stand out. So in that case, you know, it can really help an application pop, as you say, be. But for other candidates, you know, they may have some solid extracurriculars, but but nothing, um, you know, particularly in remarkable, but they stand out because of their, you know, extraordinary professional achievements and their, their academics. So, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to be extraordinary on every dimension, but it's about, you know, showing that you're a balanced candidate and, and looking to shine at least in one particular dimension. Agreed. And so let's move on to kind of nearly the final part of the discussion. So what are the top tips for an INSEAD application? Okay, well, I'll jump in there. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, it's important to take some time before you start working on the application to really reflect. Reflect on your career path, reflect on, you know, what has made you the person that you are today? What has shaped you as an individual? Um, because the application is quite long and I have to take some responsibility for that. There are several questions you have to respond to and it can look quite daunting. Um, the good thing about having a long application is that it really gives you the opportunity to tell your story in multiple dimensions. And sometimes, you know, we work with clients who are applying to um, INSEAD and LBS and other international schools, as well as the US schools. And often the US schools have shorter applications. And so, you know, that can seem more appealing, but at the end of the day, sometimes the candidates feel happier with um, their applications for, um, for INSEAD um, a London Business School because they feel that they've had the opportunity to 
to tell more of their story and and um, they feel proud of um, you know the multiple elements that they've been able to get across to the school which is sometimes more difficult in a very short application um, so do take advantage of that space but don't just dive into writing your application straight away and and think carefully about um, things like you know your motivation for applying to business school think carefully about your career goals think about that logical thread um, right if you are looking to make a career change it's important to think about, you know, what are the transferable skills that you've developed in your career and your life to date that will be useful for your future career and interesting for a future recruiter. Um, and um, so, so all of that reflection um, is a great foundation. And that's something that we do at the start of the process, process when we start working with our, with our clients is to, um, you know, take them through this deep reflection process to really sort of set the foundation for for the application before diving into writing anything. Um, and then I would say that, um, you know, a mistake or, or um, you know, an, uh, something that I think is a shame some applications that I, I've seen is that candidates focus um, too much on, on just on a professional story um, because they think that, you know, the school's really just interested in the professional track record and the academic track record. But that's not the case. They really want to get to know you as an individual. Um, they want to know your personal story. They want to understand your, your values, your motivation, what makes you tick. Um, and so there are opportunities to weave that into the application. And so do take advantage of that. And sometimes candidates are not sure, you know, is this relevant to my, to my application? Um, you know, um, it may be that um, they went through some particularly challenging period in their life it could be even going back to childhood and that could have had a big impact on 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 you know what inspired them and what and um, sort of triggered the path that they followed um, and candidates can sometimes be concerned that it's not strictly relevant to um to their to their MBA application and I would encourage you to be um you know to, to really strike a balance in your application between your prof your professional story and your personal story because the school is absolutely interested in both and you know, if you're able to give them a sense, a, a broader sense of who you are, you'll probably, um, you know, really pique their interest and, and they'll want to learn more about you. And how will they learn more about you? It, it will be when they invite you to interview. And that's what you want to do is, you you know, you want to to trigger that interest um, to take you to the next stage. So so I would say, you know, encourage you to think about how you can strike that balance between those those parts of your story. And then, um you know, it's important to, um, you know, as you said, take some time to take stock up front and then take time for the application because it's not something that you can knock out overnight. Um, most people go through multiple iterations of their, of their application and there are, there are several parts, right? There's the application form, there's the CV, um, there's the, um, there's the, there are the essays. Uh, you also have to, you know, you should be um, working closely with your recommenders because it's important that what they say is really complementary to how you're presenting yourself in your application. Um, so, you know, give yourself the benefit of some time because I'm sure that, um, you know, most of you are incredibly busy individuals who are juggling a busy day job with, with trying to um, also work on your MBA application. So do start well ahead of time so that you're not in a rush at the last minute. Um, and then I would say, you know, another part of the NCI application, of course, is the video questions that you submit um, uh, around the time of the application deadline. And um, you have a short uh, window when you need to submit those. And sometimes candidates sort of get caught up so much in the written application that they don't really think about those video questions and they can be a little, little bit taken by surprise by, by those. So do carve out some time to prepare for those. And you won't know the questions ahead of time that they're going to ask you in, in that exercise, but you can definitely practice and, and um, practice does, does help to make perfect, right? So that, that practice will be useful, um, especially with sort of managing the time limit that you have with responding to those questions, which is, which is very short. You, know, you have 60 seconds to respond to each question. That's, that goes very quickly. So definitely encourage you to, to dedicate some time to that as well. I agree. And, you know, everyone, please do make sure, you know, especially on the unique aspect, there is no like stamp on exactly who you need to be. They really need to get to know you. So, you know, just to reemphasize again, what Caroline said in, you know, in the middle for, you know, do really show life events, things that have changed you. They are indeed important. 
But let's move to LBS. And so there's two questions, Emma, that we're actually gonna go through today. So your top tips for LBS as a whole. And then one of our anonymous attendees asked something that we often uh, get questioned on, which is at INSEAD, obviously you need the languages. How important is it to know more than one language at LBS? Okay, let's, let's start with that one first. So um, unless they have changed again, so back in the day when I was there, um, LBS did ask you to have a second language to I think it was level two, slightly random level system um, by the time you graduated. And, you know, because it is a very global school, it was something that we thought was important. Um, you know, I'm a, a bit of a monoglot coming from New Zealand, so sort of stuck out on the edge of the world. So my languages are, are limited, are very basic Japanese, but not much else. Um, but it, it was seen as something that was very important as, you know, sort of showcasing, I guess, the global nature of the school and encouraging people to learn about other cultures through through the language and obviously all the, the sort of depth and, and richness that that brings. Um, it did, however, cause um, large drama for, for a large number of our um, sort of cohort, people who had come from Britain, um, people on our little aisles don't often tend to learn um, additional languages, um, although it is, I'm pleased to say, increasing massively through the school system. Um, so they, I think, um, correct in saying that it is still the same, dropped the formal requirement, but there is still the option to learn languages. So if you want to, and when you join LBS, you can still take languages like Russian, Spanish, German, um, what else is there? Yeah, Japanese, Italian, German, French. And those are available as um, electives through King's College London. So it's an affiliated um, college of the University of London. So, um, so it's more of a, of a nice to have, not always a need to have at LBS in the same way that it is um, at NCI. Um, in terms of top tips, so pretty much everything that Caroline said, although the video interview is slightly different at LBS because it is um, after the, the invitation to interview is, is made. So you don't have to do it pre-submission of your application. Um, I think one of the things that is, is really interesting about LBS is this kind of strap line that you'll see plastered all over the website now, which is this idea of minds alive. Um, and it, these are the kind of the things and the traits that LBS believes will set eventually thriving businesses um, apart from failing businesses. So this idea of, of what I call the three Cs, so um, curiosity, creativity, and collaborativeness, um, and those kind of key traits are, are some of the things that the LBS admissions team is looking for in its successful um, candidates um, when it's looking for it to bring in its, its class each year. So if you can kind of keep those things, those, those personal traits in the back of your mind when you're pulling your application together, you will go quite a long way to demonstrating the, um, the examples and, and the experience um, that will align with what the admissions committees are looking for. So yeah, so curiosity, creativity and collaborativeness um, are, are really important things for the LBS application. Um, and one other thing that, that we haven't sort of really talked about much so far is outreach. So, you know, network, 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 and there's no excuse, you know, even in the middle of a pandemic for not doing sort of your due diligence now and, and reaching out to students, to alum, um, obviously in a, in, a, in a respectful way that's um, understanding of, of people's time commitments. But, you know, you have social media platforms like LinkedIn. Um, every business school out there offers a huge range of webinars, of coffee chats, of, of um, online campus tours. Um, so, so really reaching out, really connecting with um, the school that you are targeting. Um, LBS has a huge number of information events online. Um, hopefully, hopefully by the end of the year, they'll be able to return to doing their, their proper information sessions face-to-face -face and their um, drop-in sessions that they have um, on campus every Monday and Friday. Um, so really, you know, taking the time to, to get to know the school and to understand the culture there and to, to have those conversations and, and ask current students, student ambassadors, ask alumni that you know um, what their experiences have been like at the school. And, and the more you network, and the more you reach out and, and have those um, conversations and engage with people, the more you will be able to, to understand what the school is looking for and, and how your own profile 
fits in line with um, with with what the school is is looking for when it fills its class. Um, and and without fail, you know, all the clients I've had, I always encourage them to to do you know outreach right from the start of the application process, right from when we start working together. It's one of the first things we talk about, along with recommenders and <laughs> getting them on board early. Um, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a really important part of the process. And, and without fail, my clients find that LBS Alignment students, as I'm sure they are in SEAD, um, are just very generous with their time and they're, they're happy and willing to share their experiences and, and, and talk to people and, and encourage them to become part of the community. So, so that's a really important part of it. Um, and other than that, identify what makes you global. And as, as we talked about earlier, it might not be the obvious things. You might not have had those advantages where you can travel in and work in, in different areas or, or study abroad, but, but find out what it is, how, how you can hook yourself into the idea of global culture and global understanding. And that will stand you in very good stead throughout the application process. Thanks, Emma. And so we're actually um, going to the last question of the day. So Caroline, I'll address this one to you. So what to expect at interview stage and how to prepare? Yeah, so um, so I'll talk about a bit, a bit about the INSEAD interview, but LBS is a little, has some has some different specificity. So, so um, I'll pass on to Emma um, when I'm done, but I would say that, um, you know, it's important to be aware at INSEAD that you'll have two interviews um, with alumni. The school will try to match you with one alum who has a somewhat similar background to you, um, one who has a different background. Um, and um, you may well have one alum who's a fairly recent grad and one who is a more senior grad. Um, so that's typically how they try to plan things out. Although, you know, it also does depend on alumni availability. So it doesn't always work out yeah. like that. Um, and um, the alumni are, um, you know, in involved in the process because um, it's an opportunity for the school to get input from someone in your local market. So given this incredible diversity of the, of the INSEAD admissions pool, um, it can sometimes be difficult for the admissions committee to gauge, um, okay, so this person from Korea has achieved this in this time frame versus someone from Brazil who's achieved that in a similar um, career in this time frame, and how does that compare? Um, and so, because of that diversity of, of, of um, in the pool, it's helpful for the school to get that local input, that local market input. So, um, so that's partly why the alumni are, you know, are involved at the interview stage. Um, so, so you'll have two separate meetings, um, you know, in, in former times, of course, it was in person and, and now interviews are on Zoom and, and um, you know, eventually things may go back to more in-person interviews, but possibly it'll still be a mix. Um, and um, the, in, the alumni have to give feedback um, to the school on some specific data points. So, so what they will ask you about, um, and it's quite predictable question. So they'll be asking you about, you know, what you've achieved in your career, why you've chosen to pursue that particular path. They'll be probing your career goals, right? Um, in your INSEAD application, there's um, quite a short section where you can write about your career goals. And, um, and so you should be prepared at the interview stage to really expand on that and talk more about, um, you know, your short-term goals, your longer-term goals, um, and the research that you've done um, to show some understanding of the path that you'll be following and how you're going to, um, especially if you're looking to make a career change, you know, how you're going to make that happen. So it's important to think about preparing that discussion because you might not have gone into a lot of detail on that at the, uh, the written application stage. Um, they will be looking to um, get a sense for what, you know, whether you're a well-rounded individual who will contribute to the life of the campus beyond the classroom. So, so they will um, ask questions about your interests outside of, of work and study. Um, and they'll also be giving feedback to the school on um, your interpersonal skills, your communication skills, their impressions of, um, you know, your personality overall. So, um, so a lot of the questions will be typical MBA interview questions. So, you know, you can definitely prepare for it. Um, you may get some um, questions from, from sort of left field. Um, so just be prepared to have something unexpected come up and, 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 um, and show that you can think on your feet. Um, 
And then, um, you know, the school does like to ask some behavioral questions. So that, so that may come up, you know, asking for examples of um, when you've demonstrated a particular behavior. So it may be, for example, asking, um, you know, when have you had to convince someone um, to do something they didn't want to do? Or when have you had to, you know, manage a difficult relationship with a colleague? Um, so sort of drilling down into specific uh, examples of experiences. And that can also come up at the video question stage as well. Um, and I would say also it's important to, um, you know, do a bit of research ahead of your interviews to learn about who you'll be meeting with. You know, now with LinkedIn and, and so on, um, it's pretty easy to find out some background information about, about the alumni that you'll be meeting with. So, so do, um, do that research ahead of time and see if you can establish some point in, in common. That could be a great icebreaker if you see that um, you, know, you have some, um, some commonality in, in your career path or your educational background or your interests. You know, that, that's great to identify that so you can sort of make that connection at the start of your discussion. Um, and then also think about the questions that you're going to ask your alumni, um, your, your interviewers. So, so um, people normally love to talk about their own experience, right? So it's always a good idea to ask them about their own experience at the school. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, they want to see that you are genuinely interested in um, attending the school, in, in um, getting to know the alumni, in, in engaging with the network. So, you know, do think about how you can demonstrate that interest as well through, through the questions. Um, so, Emma, you want to say a few words about the, the format at LBS? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, Anna, it'd be great to get a, a brief overview in the last two minutes of any additional points that you think are specific to LBS. Yeah, so um, as I said, the video interview comes after your invitation to interview. So um, what is different to NCAD is that the first question is set um, and the second is random. So from an ideas bank, so question bank, so um, that you really do have to prepare quite carefully for that set question. Um, and then, as Caroline said, practice, practice. Um, the interview, there is one alum um, who will have access to your entire um, application form, resume, recommendations, that's different from a lot of US schools in particular. Um, generally matched with someone from um, a similar industry to you, if at all possible. Not always the case because, you know, the school interviews all over the world, but they do try and do that. Um, the questions similar, you know, why MBA, why LBS? So really important to kind of show your passion for school, let your personality come through because, you know, this is the first time that they've seen you. They really want to know that you are going to be a good representative of their brand if it's an alum, you know, as it's an alum that's interviewing you. Um, the other thing that is specifically different is that LBS has um, what started out when I was there as a kind of a, a little presentation, five minute presentation that's now called a case study um, or it has become known as a, as a sort of mini case study. And that is where the alum will give you um, a question, pose a question to you, you have five minutes to prepare it. Um, and then you're given five minutes to present your ideas. So a lot of my clients get really quite sort of freaked out about that in advance and they get panicky and think, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Um, but really what LBS and, and what the team that, um, at LBS is looking for there is an ability to structure your thoughts, to think on your feet, to deliver your presentation with flair and with charisma. So not somebody that's going to panic and get flustered if it's something that they don't know about. So, you know, being able to hold your own so that they know that as you progress through your career and when you have to present to a board or whatever the situation may be, that you can really, you know, have impact and make sure that you maintain that composure. So that's that's um, something with the LBS interview process that's a little bit different from NCAD um, and something that I work on quite closely with my clients when we do mocks because often it's, it's something that strikes fear um, but other than that, yeah, similar kinds of questions, behavioral questions. Um, one thing I would say is that, you know, just think about structure when, you, when you're when you being interviewed. It's really important that whatever you have to say, it's clearly structured so that you're not making your interview work too hard in terms of trying to listen, you know, trying to work out where your thought processes are going, because that's something that you will be marked on um, by, by your interviewer. Um, just trying to think if there's anything else, Caroline, I think that's probably the main differences between yeah, the two. I think you've got it. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more with the structured approach then at the end. So I wanted just as we come to, to the end, wanted to thank you both, Emma and Carolyn. And I know that throughout the hour, we've kind of incorporated the session, the questions from all the attendees, at least the main ones. So just for everyone on the call and anyone that then listens um, after to the recording, if you have any questions that have been unanswered, you know, on INSEAD or LBS or on the other schools that we're talking about in these weekly masterclasses, like please do sign up to a free consult. We'll be able to, and send us your CV as well on that. We'll be able to look through your CV and we'll be able to have, you know, a 30 minute in-depth chat specific to your profile. Thank you everyone again, and hopefully see you at the next weekly call. Have a lovely day.